Welcome, and thank you for joining Voting Rights for All, a conversation on centering disability and civic engagement. Before we begin, a few messages about your access and engagement during the program. We will be accompanied throughout the event by ASL interpreters Mike Barrios and Candace Davider from LC Interpreting Services. Live closed captioning is available and may be accessed by clicking on the closed caption button at the bottom of your screen. The chat box feature will be used to broadcast messages to you. If you have any questions for our speakers, please use the Q&A function located on the bottom of your screen. If you have technical questions or issues during the event, please email av at fordfoundation.org. Thank you. Our program will begin shortly. All people need to be able to exercise their right to speak out, their right to vote, their right to make their voices heard. Oftentimes, fiscal barriers, attitudinal barriers, and policy barriers really prevent people with disabilities to be full participants in our society. My name is Alice Moore. There are still a lot of barriers to people with disabilities face to political participation. For example, in 2012, over 30% of people with disabilities reported difficulty voting to compare to 8% of non-disabled people. People with disabilities are still facing numerous barriers, whether it's at the police station, whether it's filling out an absentee ballot, or whether they're even allowed to vote because there are people with intellectual and developmental disabilities, many of whom are under guardianship for various reasons. Many judges bar people under guardianship from voting, and I think that's another huge human rights issue. They may need assistance with decision-making, but that doesn't mean they don't have an idea of who they want to vote for or, you know, a desire to vote for somebody. People with disabilities have a voice, whether it's an actual literal voice or not. People have thoughts, people have desires, people want to be involved. That's the work that needs to be done. Thank you and welcome. Thank you for joining us for Voting Rights for All, a conversation on centering disability and civic engagement. I'm Darren Walker and I'm wearing a blue blazer, a blue and white shirt. I'm sitting in my office at the Ford Foundation. The video you just saw features Alice Wong disability activist, media maker, and founder director of the Disability Visibility Project. Alice is a co-partner of an amazing project, hashtag Crip the Vote, a nonpartisan online movement encouraging the political participation of disabled people. 2020 celebrates the 30th anniversary of this amazing moment. The 30th anniversary of the enactment of the disability of the Americans with Disabilities Act, a historic and transformational piece of civil rights legislation. In commemoration of this anniversary, Ford Foundation is hosting a series of conversations dedicated to celebrating disabled leadership, building community between social justice and disability movements and inciting philanthropy to work towards equal opportunity and full participation for all. We recognize and celebrate the work of activists like Judy Human to push for the enactment of the ADA, but we know there's more to be done. Some of it was not perfect, that legislation, and we know that 30 years later, 
there is indeed so much to be done. Disabled people represent one of the most marginalized groups in American society. The highest poverty rates, lowest educational attainment and employment rates of any minority group and intersect with all other groups. Structural racism, class, gender discrimination compound the discrimination that disabled people face. Centering the voices of women, people of color with disabilities and queer and trans folks with disabilities is vital to addressing disability inequality. In Ford's funding, we've seen the power of this community in the fight for social justice and equality a community that values inclusion and intersectionality in its principles and approaches. Yet in philanthropy, we donors rarely consider disabled people in our diversity initiatives or our funding approaches. For all its power, the ADA's legal tenants were just a start to dismantling the everyday stigma and discrimination that disabled people in this country face. And we must face it that here at Ford, in the past, the Ford Foundation has been a part of the problem. Throughout the foundation's history, we have worked to remove the obstacles that prevent people from participating fully, freely, and with dignity in the world. But it was not until 2016, as part of our mission to disrupt inequality, that we committed to ensuring that disability rights and inclusion were included in our grant making, our communications, our hiring, our physical space and operations. We realized that disrupting inequality would be impossible if we did not center disability in our approach. Ford is committed to making disabilities, to making events as accessible as possible and welcoming as many people as possible. In today's event, you will see how we are integrating some of these practices into virtual events. From our audio description you heard me give at the beginning to the live captioning to ASL, we are committed to hosting events where everyone's needs are met and everyone feels welcome. We aren't perfect by any means. And so we welcome your feedback as it will strengthen our practices. Today's conversation could not be more timely. In 2020, the challenges to voting rights, voter suppression, voter restoration, access to the, ba to the ballot are more significant than ever. And due to both the COVID-19 pandemic and the response to it, Excuse me, I'm very sorry. I just learned that my camera is not working. Disabled people today are facing even more challenges to voting, to voting at the federal, state, and local election level. As voting rights groups and advocates are mobilizing for new policies and changes, we need to ensure voter enfranchisement and protection of the right to vote, the needs of the disability community must be included and connected to these broader efforts. We will hear today from leaders in the disability community and voting rights field on what is at stake in 2020, how we can support and foster effective collaboration between disability and voting rights groups and what long-term actions funders need to take to ensure they're applying a disability lens to their existing voting rights and civic engagement grant making. So please join me in welcoming Dr. Bianca I. Laureano, disability justice educator, who will be leading us through today's conversation. Thank you, over to you, Bianca. Thanks, Darren. Hi, everyone. I'm Bianca Loriano, and I am a light-skinned Black Puerto Rican with big hair cascading all over my head and down my shoulders, and I'm wearing a black striped pink dress. Um, I also am wearing glasses that are gold-rimmed, and they're in a cat's eye shape. 
I'm really excited to welcome all of you. And I wanted to just note before I introduce our speakers for today that part of my role as a moderator is to make sure that our speakers and their brilliance is clear for everyone that's joining us and that you're able to follow along and participate in our conversation. So that might look like me pausing and interrupting us while we're having a really great conversation. We've already talked about this with our speakers, so just know that in advance. We are also going to push the conversation in a new and important direction when we talk about voting, disability, and accessibility. And so we're not just going to talk about the medical or the social model of disability, we're going to bring in and be guided by the justice model of disability. And so you'll hear me reference a few of the disability justice principles in some of our questions. So I'd like to now invite and introduce Imani Barberin, and I'd like for her to turn her camera on and turn her mic on and introduce herself and give us an audio description. Hello, everyone. I hope you all can hear me. My name is Imani Barberin. I'm a disability rights activist and advocate. Um, I am the mind behind crutchesandspice.com. I'm also the Twitter handle by the same name. I'm sorry if I was rude to you. Not that sorry, but a little bit. Um, I'm an African-American woman in her 30s. I'm wearing a pink uh, sweater. I have dreadlocks that are down to my waist. Um, and I'm very, very happy to be here. So thank you all for asking me to be a participant. Thanks, Imani. I'd like to also bring in our second speaker, who is Michelle Bishop. I invite Michelle to turn her camera on and turn her microphone on and to give us an audio description and short bio. Hi everyone, my name is Michelle Bishop and I identify first and foremost as a longtime fan of the Crutches and Splice blog, you should check it out. But I am also the voter access and engagement manager at an organization called NDRN, the National Disability Rights Network. We're a national membership association for disability rights organizations that are in every state, territory and district in the US. I am a white woman in her 30s wearing a black sweater and black frame glasses, and I usually have big, unruly, curly hair, but it's pulled back today, so you can't tell. Thank you, Michelle. So I'm just going to dive right into it because we have some really great questions. And so my first one is a question that is guided by the first disability justice principle, which is intersectionality. And, you know, we are... Um, encouraged to examine power and how it is used in a way that oppresses other people, so power over others. And this is specifically rooted in ableism, especially for disabled people. And so my question is, how do you understand voting rights, voting disenfranchisement, and suppression in 2020 from an intersectional lens that centers disability? I guess I could go first with that. This is Amani speaking. Um, one of the ways in which we, I, we have to approach voting is knowing in way, the ways in which all of these systems are connected um, as disability issues. A lot of people think of disability as just this one little bubble where all these things happen and there's no outside factors, but there are. Um, and it's, especially when it comes to voting and um, disability, accessibility is often used as a weapon to disenfranchise black and brown voters. Um, for instance, in 2018, we saw many polling stations that were shut down in pr predominantly black and brown neighborhoods because they were inaccessible. Um, and with 60 to 80% of polling places uh, on record as being inaccessible in some way, that could literally happen virtually anywhere in the country um, to disenfranchise any number of voters. So we see a lot of the ways in which the disability community is often pitted against um, racial minorities and a lot of people don't question it because if you say something is for the advancement of disabled people nobody's going to be like oh well no that's not going to happen we're not going to do it people will say oh we'll protect these people but really what you need to be doing is centering the voices of disabled people and particularly those who are also racial minorities like myself and say what is it that you need to get to the polls what is it that you need to cast your ballot um, because we cannot think of accessibility as a weapon, it is a tool for all. 
I have to agree completely with what Imani's saying, actually. Um, and I think it's malicious and, and intentional. And to a large extent, a smoke screen. I think accessibility is used as a smoke screen for really traditional types of voter suppression. NDRN actually released a report called Blocking the Ballot Box this past January on this exact issue. And we looked at counties across the country that were closing down polling places and claiming it was because they weren't compliant with the Americans with Disabilities Act. And really interesting what we found, Amani's right, the majority of polling places in the US aren't accessible, but a lot of the counties that were making that claim weren't producing accessibility surveys, hadn't spoken to the disability community, and sometimes actually admitted they don't understand the ADA. So I think that makes it really clear what we're doing here. And I think it's really important to note that disability rights organizations don't ever say, shut down your polling place if it's not accessible. We say make it accessible or maybe relocate it in the immediate area to a better location. But we never say, why don't you just close 80% of the polling places in the county? That'll really benefit people with disabilities. That doesn't make voting more accessible for anyone. So I think there's something really intentional that's happening here where our community is being used as a pawn to get at voters, specifically black, black and brown voters, who are the traditional targets of voter suppression and closing polling places and moving them out of those neighborhoods is one of the oldest tricks in the book, uh, especially now that they have a little extra freedom without preclearance under the Voting Rights Act to just go ahead and do that. They don't have to get it approved by DOJ anymore. I think that's a really big issue. And I think when we talk about fighting voter suppression, I think the place where we're still lacking is that as a, as a civil rights community, not just disability justice organizations, but a full civil rights community, we don't acknowledge the extent to which these communities do intersect and overlap, that people with disabilities are black and brown voters, people with disabilities are low income voters. So when we talk about closing those polling places, um, we're talking about black people who have disabilities, who it's gonna be even harder for them to get to that polling place that's now hours away. When we talk about voter ID laws, really strict photo ID laws, and who it's who's hurt, you know, in attempting to get that ID, we're talking about low income voters, but we're also talking about low income people with disabilities who have to get that ID and the DMV may not even be wheelchair accessible, right? So there's so much, um, interplay between these communities and we tend to talk about them like they're two discrete populations uh, and I think as a whole community we could be doing better about acknowledging all of that and how whether or not people with disabilities are the targets of this type of suppression they're absolutely feeling the effects of it. And I just wanted to note um, getting off of what Michelle said is that the you know Black and brown communities are overrepresented by disabilities. So when you say that you're disenfranchising or you're shutting down a polling place because of accessibility issues, you're, speci you're specifically targeting black and brown voters. You know, black and indigenous people are the two groups with the highest rates of disability with 25% of African Americans with a disability and 30% of indigenous people with a disability. So these are very intentional things that are happening. Absolutely, we're also overrepresented among low income voters, we're overrepresented among Native American voters, Asian American voters, and this is good data. This is coming from the census. This is coming from the CDC. Uh, this is coming from reliable sources that are collecting this information. So for sure, we know that people with disabilities are overrepresented among the communities that are hardest hit by these tactics. Absolutely, and I think both of you bring in a really important piece, and I just want to name it out loud, is that there's a lot of stereotypes about people with disabilities. And this is one of the reasons why we wanted to bring in a justice model, because the social model of disability often only looks at what racially white disabled people do, what their needs are, and that really doesn't offer a wider range or lens to acknowledge how power is also deeply embedded in the disenfranchisement, but also just deeply connected to other forms of oppression that we're seeing and experiencing as disabled people. And so this really is a beautiful dovetail into my next question, which, <clears throat> you know, the practice of being guided by those who are most impacted is deeply rooted in a variety of different justice frameworks that we understand, in addition to disability justice. And so my question is, we in the United States, we have witnessed the brilliance of disabled activists, especially in their response to COVID-19, the pandemic, 
Uh, how is disabled people's participation in voting uh, in 2020 impacted by that? How, what do you see some connections that are showing up for each of you? Well, I wanted to say that like disabled people have been organizing in online spaces uh, forever and especially it kind of hit its pinnacle with uh, Crip the Vote. And so we've seen now a lot of uh, a lot of engagement with the disability community. And so that's extremely important to know. And then also with the pandemic, um, a lot of the very same accessibility features, like the fact that we're on a Zoom call right now, are things that disabled people have been calling for for years. Let's make all of our uh, let's make all of our communications accessible. And so when we think of voting, we when we think of voting specifically at the ballot box or at uh, with your ballot in your hand. That's not always the case. Um, you know, it's also communications from candidates. It's also um, mailers for people who want to know more about what they're voting on. It's also participation in town, town halls. Um, and so we have to think of the entire electoral process, the entire campaigning process differently. And the disability community has kind of shown the way and you're kind of using that right now. Um, in terms of be actually casting your ballot, one of the things that I always try to tell people is proximity is not always accessibility. Just because you're closer to something, just because it's in your hand does not make it accessible to every single person with a disability. Um, we always like to call, we use uh, snowflake as an insult now, but everybody is unique and so disabilities are unique as well. Um, the way I access a ballot would not be the same as somebody who is blind who would, wants to access a ballot. And so mail-in ballots are not always accessible to blind or low vision voters. Um, people who have technological issues may not be able to access uh, voter registration on their phone or computer. They may not have internet access. Um, and then you also think about historically marginalized groups who have been disenfranchised, right? And so being physically at a polling station is incredibly important to those groups because they can say, I am seen, I am counted. People have to take notice of my vote because I'm here and now in their faces. And so I, I feel like there are a lot of people with disabilities who are also going to go down that road and say, I really want to be in a polling center. And so we have to think about that accessibility as well as uh, exposure to COVID, long wait times, standing in line for too long. So there's a whole host of issues that I see arising. Um, and I think that non-disabled people kind of think of a one size fits all approach to accessibility, but we really need to think of accessibility as like, a restaurant menu. Think of it as like the Cheesecake Factory menu. There are more options on that menu that are physically possible to, to absorb. But make accessibility like that. Make it like a pick and choose for people with disabilities who want to be able to vote. Make it all available to us. And I think the Americans with Disabilities Act is clear on this issue that whatever option is available to non-disabled voters also has to be available to voters with disabilities. And I think that's really being brought, dragged into the light and exacerbated by COVID-19 because, you know, it, we have a, we get stuck a lot of times with your polling place is not accessible, but you can just vote absentee. Or our mail-in voting is not accessible, but you can just go to your polling place, which was never acceptable. But the inaccessibility of mail-in voting has flown under the radar for far too long. It's in, by and large completely inaccessible to so many people with disabilities. And now that COVID is changing everything about the way that we vote, we're really having to grapple with some of those things. You can't tell someone your polling place is inaccessible, so you can just stay home and vote by mail. If your vote by mail system is to mail someone a piece of paper, if a blind voter can't take a pen and mark that piece of paper in a polling place, they don't magically regain their vision when they go home and sit at their kitchen table. They can't do it there either. You know, if you didn't come up with some sort of electronic delivery system for mail-in ballots, that's a problem. That's going to be a huge problem, especially when we talk about how few polling places there are going to be in November because locations are not willing to serve. It's completely voluntary and some of them shouldn't. Nursing homes probably should not be serving as polling places right now and letting people who are potentially carriers for COVID in and near their residence. Um, we're talking about it now that electronic ballot delivery has been like the preferred method of making your vote by mail accessible, but 
we require people to generally print off a piece of paper and return it, which once again makes the process inaccessible. If I'm quadriplegic and I use my computer at home to mark that ballot and then it, the paper runs off a printer, what am I doing with that? I don't have use of my hands, right? That's not a private and independent vote for me. Uh, an issue that no one seemed to care about until a whole bunch of people were stuck at home with no printer. And all of a sudden, everyone realizes how problematic that is. Or we're all taxing our home internet so hard right now because, you know, two parents are on a Zoom call, three kids are on a Zoom classroom, and somebody's streaming Netflix for some reason, right? And the internet's crashing. And, and what are we going to do with this? These are issues that have always been problematic from an access perspective and, quite frankly, violations of federal law that I think are really coming to light right now. We're worried a little bit about what some voters with disabilities are going to do if you're immunocompromised and there's not an accessible mail delivery system or your ballot doesn't arrive in time, are you going to go to the polling place? Is it near you? Are there enough polling stations? Milwaukee was supposed to have 180 in their primary and they had five. Uh, who knows how far away some of those were from some of those voters, but they also had so much trouble trying to social distance them. You saw lines that were several city blocks long. Uh, there are people with disabilities who just cannot face that. We have to start leveraging opportunities like curbside voting so people can stay. It'll look like a COVID testing center at this point. You drive up, you stay in the car with your mask on, and a poll worker's there in full PPE uh, to help you limit your exposure while you're casting your ballot. And quite frankly, you know, people who are positive for COVID-19 are also eligible voters. So how are we going to have those folks vote as well? All these questions that we don't know how to answer and part of the problem is that if we had worked as hard as we should have to make it accessible before 2020, we would have had fewer questions to answer in 2020. Yeah, absolutely. And I think you both did a really great job of demonstrating that, you know, if we had these ideas that mail-in voting was really super accessible, we now have a fuller understanding because we're hearing from disabled people who are telling us this is how it's not accessible. And that being a really big and important piece of doing work with disabled people guiding the way. Um, and I think that's so, so important. And then Amani brought in also the um, language of visibility. People, there are disabled people who want to be seen voting. There are disabled people who want to do it in a way that demonstrates their choice to engage in the process that we have to uphold and envision democracy in the United States. And I think it's a really important thing to keep in mind that, you know, what is the benefit and the privilege for those of us who may not consider it in the same way that a disabled person might engaging in that voting, that act of voting. My next question is around interdependence, which is another disability justice principle. And you know, this is one way that disabled people have offered a model of community collaboration for the rest of the world. And you know, thinking about how COVID-19 has reshaped the 2020 election, has it distracted us from the election or merely altered the issues that we're focusing on? Has it changed any of the top issues for any of you? I think. You know, I was worried early on that it was distracting us from the election because going into 2020, uh, we were seeing record levels of enthusiasm for this election. Gallup poll tracks enthusiasm for an election kind of starting the fall before all the way through election day. And last fall, the numbers that they have from I think like November 2019 like 60 something percent of voters were very enthusiastic about election day. Those aren't the fall before election kind of numbers. Those are like the October immediately before the election kind of numbers, right? Um, so we were at like really high. This is like 2008 levels of enthusiasm. And we saw this little dip right around March and April when things got really bad. And some of us were re dealing with some really intense stuff and the rest of us were really just anxious and depressed, right? And folks weren't focusing on the election, but I'm really encouraged because they've put out their August 2020 numbers recently and it's back up. Now we're seeing like 70% of people are enthusiastic and ready for this election. Those are pretty big numbers as well. Those aren't typical numbers. So I think folks are refocusing on this election and I think we have to for people with disabilities, the issues that are important. Um, you know, COVID response in itself, you, we've seen just 
solutions, potential solutions for COVID just tossed out there, sometimes really carelessly that have real consequences for people with disabilities. When we talk about using ventilators and a shortage of ventilators, what happens to people with disabilities who rely on a ventilator all the time? and the, the possibility that that could be taken from them. When we talk about using medications as a potential cure for COVID that are used to treat lupus, what happens to the people who now can't get their lupus meds refilled because big pharma companies took them to test them on COVID? Uh, when we talk about rationing of care and making decisions, about who's gonna get a hospital bed, who's gonna get a ventilator, and whose life is worth saving. And people with disabilities are at the bottom of that list. That's incredibly offensive. And we're also seeing loss of jobs. People with disabilities uh, have reported at higher numbers than their non-disabled peers that they have either lost a job or believe they're going to lose their job within like the next three months, right? So we are not only the last hired, but now we're the first fired as well. We're losing our jobs. So if you think about whatever your beliefs are, who you think is best suited to lead this country, you've got to be thinking about what's their response going to be to the pandemic? What are they going to do about the economy and employment? And how does that impact people with disabilities? Because we're getting hit by this really hard. I think going off of what Michelle said, I think that there's enthusiasm for the election, not just because this is a very tumultuous election, but also because every single societal ill that we've been pushing off to the side for the last decade, 20 years, 30 years, is now right in front of us. We're watching wildfires in Oregon, disability issue, because disabled people can't always evacuate or have a month's worth of medications when they leave their home. Um, we're talking about healthcare rationing and, and the value of people with disabilities by society. You know, disabled people literally panicked at the beginning of the, epi of the pandemic because we knew we'd be last to be saved. And as somebody with cerebral palsy, watching, watching black women, especially with my disability, die every single week, that's emotionally taxing. We're watching, um, like, like Michelle said, people getting last, fired for, last hired, first fired, people with disabilities, particularly black people with disabilities and black women who are overrepresented as having disabilities. Um, schools are reopening. Special education isn't, you know, quite what it used to be. Children are trying, children and families are really trying to make these systems work, but that's not sustainable for an entire school year. There's, I mean, every single thing you could think of is a disability issue, and therefore, every single issue is necessary to address. And we, we, we underestimate just how much politics play a role in our lives, and one of my most hated phrases from people is when people say, oh, I don't, you know, I don't do politics. You do politics, you're breathing, so you do politics. Um, so we really have to start reframing the ways in which we think about disability and ability. And one of the things that we've started to, to find in the disability community is a lot of non-disabled people or seemingly non-disabled people are, are really starting to have to come to terms with their own physical vulnerabilities. Um, there's a lot more disabled people in this country than we even think there is. Um, last estimate showed about 19%, that's about 25%. Uh, I would even venture to guess it's about 30%. Given the medical racism and systemic issues that we have, it's a lot higher than we think it is. Um, and I would put money on that. So I think that a lot of these issues are making people excited to vote. I wouldn't even say excited, but desperate to vote, desperate to get leadership in place. That, that affirms their lives, affirms their ability to live freely, um, and really think about the ways in which we can move society forward together. And I think before we move on to, I think we've got to talk about police brutality. Yes. Which is one of the primary issues of 2020 and in this election, and should be, quite frankly, um, at some point we're going to have to deal with it as a problem and a byproduct of widespread systemic racism. But there is a sub movement of Black Lives Matter called Black Disabled Lives Matter because there is evidence to show that I think the statistic I've seen reported, and Mani, correct me if I'm wrong, is that 30 to 50 cent percent of incidents of police brutality involve a person with a disability because yes. police are not prepared to interact with autistic people. 
people who are deaf or hard of hearing who can't understand you or hear you when you are shouting at them to do something like put their hands up, right? Um, people with all types of disabilities, who, people with mental illness, right? Why are we sending police to respond when someone who's living with mental illness needs needs emotional support or some sort of community support system in place, not police officers with guns, you know, tasing them and sitting on their chests and all the things that we're seeing happening on our televisions or sometimes in our actual lives on an extremely regular basis. There's a real overlap there uh, in terms of black and brown people who are being subjected to police brutality and people with disabilities who are experiencing it as well. And so our community in a large part lives in fear uh, of those things as well. And I think it's really driving people. It's, it, I hope that it will drive people to the polls the way it's driven people into the streets in protest. And I also wanted to add on to that, that the entire criminal justice system is ableist. It is very much so built upon black and brown bodies who, with disabilities existing in prisons. And when we think about it historically, around the exact same time that, um, that uh, broken windows policing and those types of things were very much in the public as well as the stereotype of welfare queens was the exact same time the institutions for the mentally and physically disabled started closing down. So, um, and then also, you know, the war on drugs happened at the exact same time. So you have people with, with disabilities who are entering into community for whom, for whom their, their behaviors are seen as criminal because of drug laws. And so it's all intersectional. It is all very much so intertwined. And at, this, at the time that I'm speaking right this second, 30 to 40 percent of prisoners in jails and prisons have a disability. Um, and so we really have to rethink about our carceral system and then not only think of prison, the prison system as uh, jails and prisons and things like that, but oftentimes just people being in situations where they cannot get out. Guardianship. Um, there's, there's entire carceral systems that have no walls around them, but are very much so pr imprisoning people with disabilities. Speaking of the prison system, I mean, not only do we lock up people with disabilities rather than, oh, I don't know, investing in appropriate community support so they can live their lives peacefully in the community, but we lock up non-disabled black and brown people and we give them disabilities because we abuse them and starve them and isolate them and beat them until they are they have PTSD and depression and anxiety and all types of disabilities that they didn't necessarily come in with or they get a simple infection or a simple injury and we just deny them adequate health care until it turns into some sort of chronic lifelong condition. We're, we're locking up non-disabled people and we're turning them into people with disabilities because we refuse to treat them with dignity. Right, and I think that definitely brings in another layer to this because, you know, one of the things that we're realizing with a COVID um, transmission is that some people have debilitating experiences with their COVID experience. And, you know, everything from a compromised immune system, which I too have, but also not just people dying because they're ill, but also people having lifelong issues with their immune systems, central nervous system. I mean, it really does attack the entire body. And so what does it mean in these two particular instances of the criminal incarceration system and COVID pandemic, where we're having an increase of more more disabled people um, experiencing the world that we're living in. And, you know, that I think is one of the reasons why when I hear you talk about this fire that's always been present for disabled people when it comes to voting, that that fire is even more ignited. And because the disabled people today who have a different politicized understanding of being disabled, um, they see what's happening. You know, we see what's happening and we are trying to prepare folks for what occurs and, you know, I was definitely part of those communities that immediately had a response, um, you know, in February when we saw things happening in other parts of the world where disabled people were like, okay, who has a generator? You know, where are the generators in our communities? Who has the N95 masks? Like, that, those are the ways that disabled communities came together and really offered this beautiful example of interdependence where we can't do it alone, we have to do it with each other and really, you know, 
coming together in the ways that we know and always do, because that's how we survive, is together and dependent on each other. And, you know, I know for a lot of non-disabled people, hearing us talk about interdependence can feel a little scary. And I know for me, being interdependent with disabled community members and non-disabled people, I feel the most free and the most liberated in those instances versus when I'm totally by myself. So it really is a new revisioning of what life is as a disabled person and the preparations that we take every day um, to live and move in the world that we exist in. Um, so I wanna shift a little bit, not too much, um, and talk a little bit about sustainability as well as collective access, which are two other disability justice principles. Because what I hear us talking about is, you know, how can we make these accessible options strong? I'm just gonna pause as we change our ASL um, interpreters. Great. Um, and so, you know, what is it, what, here's the question. What do we know about the methods of voting that are most accessible for all US citizens to vote. I know that each of you shared a little bit already about mail-in voting. Um, and so maybe what I really want to know is, what, do you, what does it take to have everybody's need met so that they may vote? Well, I have an incredibly unsatisfying answer to this question. <laughs> and I bet Imani's thinking the same thing. There isn't a best way. There is no one way to make voting accessible. And Imani kind of talked about this early on. Every disability is different. When we talk about a disability community, we're really talking about people with a broad range of different types of disabilities. But even two people who have the same disability don't experience it the same way. No two people with cerebral palsy have exactly the same challenges or symptoms or societal barriers. No people, no two people with blindness even necessarily have the same level of blindness, right? And so what works for someone doesn't necessarily work for another person with a disability. And I think that's true of non-disabled people, right, as well. I think for voters, you know, for some, vote by mail is going to work best. For some, voting in person works best. Uh, for some folks, they uh, need that accessible device. Some need to use the audio. Some want to use the touch screen. Um, coming during early voting, you know, if I can pick a day that works for me, a day and time that works for me because of my work schedule or my child's care schedule or when I have a ride or I need someone to assist me, when can they go with me? It's so different for everyone. We really have to do this like everything but the kitchen sink model where we like, um, Imani said early on, this menu of options, that Cheesecake Factory, like 30 page menu that overwhelms me, um, you know, <laughs> and so I can pick what works best for me. And I think that's going to be especially true during a pandemic because um, what you traditionally works best for me might change if my polling place is a lot further away, or I'm re really worried about that congestion that we might see at polling places, especially if there's no early voting and everyone has to show up on the same day, or maybe vote by mail. Um, traditionally, uh, is something that didn't work for me, but it's been made more accessible now. Um, what if I am testing positive for COVID-19? Can I vote by mail? Did I test positive after the deadline for vote by mail? In which case, what am I going to do? Do I forfeit my vote? Or is there a limited exposure option for me to vote in person? We have to really think through all the different challenges that voters face in being able to cast their ballot and just create a broad range of options to try to make it work for as many people as possible. Yeah, I think that when we when we talk about accessibility, there's very much so like this attitude from non-disabled people, like if we do this one thing, it'll work, right? We're gonna do it, so it's gonna work, right? And disabled people are looking at you all like, no, it's not, <laughs> you know, even between me and my boyfriend, my boyfriend and I have the exact same disability, but he has it on his right side of his body and I have it from the waist down. So we have very different needs when it comes to just even getting into our own apartment. So I think that when we talk about accessibility, it's never going to be, be an easy answer or one size fits all. And we have to really kind of disavow ourselves of that idea. Um, and when we talk about um, disability and accessibility, especially with the, when it comes to the polls, making sure that not only are all these options available, but people know about them. There are non-disabled people or who people who consider themselves non-disabled who very much so can access any of the accessibility tools at a polling station or via online that they may need to use. Um, and one of the things that I find very difficult as a disabled person is that the idea that we kind of have to brand accessibility as a life hack for you in order to use it or to care about it. <laughs> um, 
and we really shouldn't have to do that because you need it too and you'll be you'll be fine there's um we have to really evaluate the the perceptions of disability and who needs them because there are people with invisible illnesses that have never really considered their accessibility needs before this moment um but yeah i i agree with michelle wholeheartedly there's never going to be a one size fits all and I'll, I'll apologize to you now but i'm not doing it again <laughs> The life hack thing is real. It's so real. Like <laughs> people who are non-disabled people never care if a sidewalk has a curb cut until they're rolling a stroller or a uh, luggage or they broke their leg or something. And then all of a sudden they realize that they can't get on the sidewalk without a struggle or they might have to walk through the street. You, if you have a wheelchair, that's like an everyday thing and curb cuts weren't invented for you because yeah. today you happen to be rolling something behind you, right? They were invented for so that people who use wheelchairs don't get hit by cars because they can't get on the sidewalk, right? And it's, it's so pervasive in all of our society. If you've ever seen those infomercials where they're trying to sell a product and they show a person who like can't open a carton of milk without milk flying everywhere. And non-disabled people are like, that's ridiculous. Nobody does that. Like who can't open a carton of milk? Okay, people with certain types of disabilities, that's who might not be able to pull open a carton of milk. The device that the, the company selling wasn't invented for you. It wasn't invented for them. But non-disabled people don't want to turn their TVs on and see those folks. So we try to make it something that looks like it's for non-disabled people. We have to keep selling accessibility like it's this thing for everyone. And there's some truth to that. The more accessible we make it, it really does benefit everyone. If you think about accessible ballots and the touchscreen machines where you can have bigger font sizes and high contrast, I promise you there are so many people who don't identify as a person with a disability who can't read the little tiny print on some of those ballots, right? It does benefit everyone, but also why do we have to sell you on this to make it a thing? Like access for everyone is just supposed to be important because we're all supposed to matter and we're all supposed to have civil and human rights because that's kind of supposed to be the basis of the United States. So our democracy and how we run our elections, it should reflect that. It needs to be as accessible as possible for every type of voter because that's just what we're supposed to be doing. That's, that is the, what we claim our ideals are as a country. And I think it's frustrating for a lot of people because there's no such thing as like accessibility. Check, we did that, it's done. Even with elections, polling places change. They move or the elevator breaks or honestly, we've seen elections where a polling place got foreclosed on the night before the election and the poll workers showed up and didn't know it wasn't gonna be there, right? Or poll workers change, new people have to be trained. Technologies that are available to us uh, change and they get better and they make so many things more accessible. We have to start embracing those and how we run our elections. It just, I think it's really frustrating for folks who don't rely on it every single day to feel like it's something that they all of a sudden have to think about every single day. But everyone who lives long enough becomes a person with a disability. So you should probably start thinking about it now because one day you will be the person who needs it every single day. Yeah, yeah. I just want to, oh, I'm sorry, Bianca. No, go for it. I, I would just challenge listeners to this uh, panel to, next time you go to anywhere in your neighborhood or anywhere you, frequent, if there's a ramp available, ask yourself why you're taking the stairs. Because if you're taking it because that's for them, those people over there, then that's the exact attitude that we're really trying to break down with you all and say, you know, it's for everybody. Accessibility is for everyone and make it so that it's less taboo for you to use the things that need you to get by. And I think another thing that we don't talk about is that as capitalists in a capitalist society, we very much so believe that in order for things to be worth it, you have to work really, really hard for it. And accessibility kind of breaks down this idea that says, oh, you have to labor in order to get the things that you need to survive. We should not be laboring for the things we need to survive. We should, it's the law. If you need to get into a building, if something needs to be accessible to you, that's the law. It's not like, it's not you just working for it so that you, for the sake of you feeling better about getting it. You should have had it in the first place. So, so really break down that, that thought process. Yeah, thank you for that reminder, Imani. Um, and I just wanna offer a reminder to the participants today that we are gonna open it up for questions and answers with our panelists. And um, during that time, so if you haven't gotten your question in, we encourage you to do that in the question and answer box. Um, and one of the things that I'd like 
for our speakers to think about and not respond just yet, but to think about before we wrap up our time together is um, to offer, you know, what would you tell funders um, is needed to build resilience and long-term solutions to these issues? And not just for the upcoming presidential election, but for all future elections that are not just national, but also local. So, you know, again, that's just something to think about. I'd love for us that for that to be like our final question where we just list off some ideas. Um, <clears throat> but right now I'd love to take a few questions from uh, our Q&A box. And I'm going to start um, with this first one. And uh, it says, as we are seeing cities moving early voting places to stadiums, arenas, in order to meet both the needs of the pandemic and the election, we know that most metropolitan areas have severely cut public transit and paratransit budgets due to decreased usage. So what should impacted folks do? What should, um, and how will we ensure that people in nursing homes and other settings are able to access their vote? Well, a lot of people, so one of, the, one of the things I like to tell people is that it's not just accessibility once you arrive, it's access every single step along the way there that is always difficult. I used to use paratransit systems um, to get from point A to point B and they are a nightmare. Like nationwide, they're not great. I mean, I would be, they would pick me up at 5 a.m. for a nine o'clock appointment and I would still get there late. So um, I think that every single, uh, every single aspect of voting needs to be accessible. Um, in terms of making sure that people vote in, in these metropolitan areas, I would encourage people to start lobbying their local transit authorities to increase, um, increase those transportation budgets. Um, and I think that one of the things that that it was, is kind of like an ironic thing is that they decreased budgets for transportation as soon as the pandemic started, but they should have actually increased it. Um, because the more availability means the less crowding on public transportation. It didn't make sense for them to decrease it in the first place, even though there was less ridership. Um, I would also start to think about mutual aid and how, like who is available to possibly drive people to the polls if they, if they physically want to go. Um, making sure that nursing, you know, nursing home staff know that the residents have the right to vote and what they need to do to assist their, their residents on voting and, able to, and are able to vote privately and independently, which is extremely important. Um, we keep saying that motto, Michelle and I, because we have to drive it home. But if you were voting with somebody looking over your shoulder, how would you vote? Um, and so making sure that these systems are increased in their capacity before election day, I mean, well afterwards actually. So I think that that's the route to go. I also want to see like short term solutions. I wish we saw more transit systems offer free rides on election day so people can get where they need to go. I want to see ride shares that are really increasing those rideshare companies offering free rides to and from the polls. I also really, really wanna see them have more wheelchair accessible vehicles as a matter of fact, <laughs> in addition to offering those rides. Um, I think we all kind of have to jump in and do what we can do to make sure everybody is able to get to the polls and vote. And I still wanna see states increasing the accessibility of their mail-in and remote voting systems as well. There's going to be some places in which polling places are just going to be very, very far away, very few and far between. So we've got to have alternate means of making sure that people can get those ballots and we need to support the United States postal system and fund them so that they can do the very critical work that they do. Absolutely. Um, we have another uh, question from folks who are attending. How do panelists think issues of, <clears throat> sorry, how do panelists think issues of disability have been integrated by get out the vote groups? What needs to change? So, <laughs> I think that like, <laughs> I'm not trying to, I'm not trying to cast shade. However, like the most, the, the most ardent supporters of disabled people voting are disabled people. I'll just be honest. And I feel like a lot of just get out the vote um, groups do not make their content accessible. They don't um, make it plain language. They don't, uh, they don't really consider us at all. And I think, I think more and more they are so now because we are, we're louder. Um, but 
but it still falls short like 75 percent of the time um there's like they don't have asl resources um and a lot of these get out the vote organizations especially the ones that are grass grassroots organizations they use the fact that they are low funded to skimp on accessibility and while we understand <laughs> that it's not always available to pay for accessibility there are people that are willing to volunteer you know groups that are, that are dedicated towards like protest access or um accessible you know voting information there are groups available that will do that um and in i think that when it comes to the disability community our needs are kind of seen as very niche despite the fact that they're in every single arena even immigration we're we're, we're hearing reports of um, abuses at immigration centers but it was disability groups that were the first to report on conditions at um, migrant detention centers for children. It was disability groups. Um, so I think that we need to start thinking about every single, uh, every single special marginalized group, making it accessible, making all of their content accessible, making sure that disability people are in leadership roles and we're not thought of as an add-on or nice to have. So, but we have actually actual things to contribute to the conversation moving forward. I would like to say something very unpopular in response to this question. Um, we're a national civil rights organization. We work with a lot of other national civil rights organizations. I will start by saying everything Amani is saying is so true. Um, a lot of other civil rights organizations that are not disability specific have inaccessible websites, social media, materials, all of that. And some of it, cost is not an issue. If you're putting videos up on YouTube, YouTube captioning is free. Um, so why isn't it there? You could have done audio description on that video with no extra cost. You already had someone doing, you know, voiceover, right? So sometimes it's not cost. It's you just didn't think to do it. You didn't bother to do it. But here's the really unpopular piece of what I want to say. There are a lot of other communities that are advocating right now for increased elections security over fears of foreign hacking. And I'm not saying that that's not an important issue. It is. But a lot of what they're proposing is specifically not accessible to people with disabilities and will disenfranchise our voters, like period, full stop. And that's a problem. If we are broadly a community that believes in civil and human rights, we cannot continue to ask people with disabilities to take one for the team and sacrifice our rights and our private and independent vote to make other people feel like their ballots more secure. That's, that's not okay. We have yeah. to start coming up with solutions that do both. Absolutely. And I feel like we are the team. <laughs> like, so why do we have to keep taking one for the team? We're the team. We're the MVPs. <laughs> um, I have another participant question for you all. Um, are there areas of the nation where voting rights for persons with disabilities are particularly problematic? And there's some geographic locations like the South or the Midwest, for example. I wouldn't say, I mean, I feel like, I feel like we have like this very much so this, this, this notion that because marginalized groups are disenfranchised more loudly down south, that it doesn't happen up north or in any other area of the country. And what I would say is that we really have to like get away from this idea of like regional disenfranchisement and think of it nationally. Um, I think that to, to answer your question, I think people in rural areas with disabilities have the hardest time voting um, because it, it takes a lot more for them to get to the polls. It takes a lot for them to plan to get there, to cast their ballot, to get mail, to get things like that. So that's where I would see it. But I don't really think of it as like, oh, the Midwest or the South has all these issues. It's, I mean, <laughs> and I think that this is like this perception about racism too. It's like, you know, racism is more, you know, more, uh, it's more violent down south but it's a lot of psychological racism up north so like it's just in different ways like it's like paint by numbers but they just cho chose a different color so <laughs> it's just you know stop thinking of it as like a regional issue and start thinking of it as an access issue with different sorts of needs based on where you live yeah i i think that's true i think that's very true i mean look there are some key states that we always talk about 
And you know, look, Georgia, whatever you've heard about Georgia, it's as bad as you think it is, right? <laughs> there's, some, there's some voting rights issues going on there. Um, there are some states that jumped out and got out in front suppressing the vote as soon as the Supreme Court decision came down that struck down part of the Voting Rights Act. I'm talking about you, Texas and North Carolina, right? So some of that is very real. But to be honest, as someone who does this work all the time, I hear a lot of the same complaints from our advocates in North and South Dakota as I do in those states that we talk about all the time. So to an extent, I think not only is Imani right, but it has very real consequences if we are funding the work in states where we think it's most prominent, then what's happening to voters in those states that we never talk about? We can't channel all of our resources just into a few states that we've determined are the most important. Everyone's vote matters and your vote matters no matter what state you're in or whether or not you're in a city or a rural area. And we really have to start thinking of it as a whole. And I think that's very true when it comes to voter access for people with disabilities because we're everywhere and accessibility is not great everywhere, right? <laughs> we know the majority of polling places are not accessible to people with disabilities. That's an everywhere thing, right? So, so much of what prevents people with disabilities from voting is that we're just not meeting our legal obligations and how we administer elections. And that's, that's an everywhere problem. There, that's an everywhere problem. There are usually sometimes like particular jurisdictions that I think really try to innovate and do well, but I couldn't even say that that necessarily always applies to a whole state, right? Everybody's got something they need to work on. So I think we really need to start thinking about every voter, no matter where they are geographically. Thank you. I have another um, participant question, which is what is the progress that has to happen in terms of public discourse and cultural change? And I'm just gonna pause us while we switch our um, ASL interpreters. Great. So I'm going to reread the question just one more time for our um, panelists. What's the progress that has to happen in terms of public discourse and cultural change? I think that more disabled people need to run for office um, with, a, with a more progressive platform. Um, one of the things that I, I, I want to say with it very much so, uh, the caveat to that is let's stop promoting people with disabilities who are harmful to our community simply because they're inspirational to non-disabled people. That's a very important thing. Um, but given that, I think that disabled people are, we're underrepresented in elected office. Um, and I think that one of the conversations that we're watching now is who is quote unquote um, competent. And a lot of that ventures into ableism because we're, we're relying upon, um, we're relying upon stereotypes about disability to disqualify people from our, from running for office, and that leads, and that means that disabled people are less likely to run for office. Um, I would encourage people other than myself to run for office, um, and I think that it's incredibly important. But also, I think that we really need to be in the room. Um, stop thinking of us as just a, a group that you need to cater to or to help out. We really want to be in positions to make changes for our communities, um, and so making sure that there's there are groups that help disabled people run for office. There are groups that um, help make sure that people with disabilities can fundraise for grassroots organizing. Make sure that you're doing that work too, because a lot of our uh, sustainability as a community relies upon one another. And so making sure that you're uplifting the voices of people in the community, first and foremost, is incredibly important to making sure that culture and, and thought processes thought processes change when it comes to people with disabilities um, and then disavow yourself of any idea of what capacity means um, when we talk about capacity i like to think about the transit system not a human being uh, like everybody has the capacity to lead and everybody has the capacity to harm so making sure that you see disabled people as they are and evaluate our viewpoints for in the ways that we express them rather than relying upon whether you think we are whether or not you think we could do the work um, and making sure that you, like I said, putting us in those positions of power. Yeah, I think we really have to start centering people with disabilities in the public discourse, in the conversations that we're having that matter. We see this a lot 
in the world of voting and elections, right? I think the Help America Vote Act was an incredibly powerful piece of legislation. It got rid of those punch card machines that I don't think any of us want to see again. And it created, you know, a lot of the accessible voting technology we use now. And that's been a great mark of progress, but the experience of how that happened it was probably less than ideal. There were a lot of people who went out and developed a voting machine and were like, look what we made for you after it was made. And we were like, so that's cool, but here's all the ways it doesn't work for us. And they were like, that's great. We already sold it to 10 states. Like, and it was already moving without our input. Like we should have been part of that conversation from the jump. We have to stop designing something and then figuring out how to make it accessible after we made what we want. Right, we do that all the time. Uh, we go and make something and then are like, oh, people with disabilities. And then you have to figure out how you're gonna retrofit it to make it accessible, which is sometimes why we come up with solutions that are as bad as they are. Um, and I think we have to do it in a meaningful way, not like tokenism. That's another thing we see a lot. Like a lot of, yes, some of these companies that develop some of these voting systems, I was like, did you talk to people with disabilities when you made this? And they're like, we did. We hired one consultant who's blind. And I'm like, okay, not only does that guy not speak for like all people with disabilities, he can't even speak for all blind people. He's just telling you what works for him. Like you can't talk to one person with a disability and be like, check inclusion. You have to involve an entire diverse community of people in a broader conversation from the get-go so we can start coming up with solutions and products and systems that are accessible from the start rather than figuring out what's wrong with them after we've deployed them nationally and they're already in use. Yeah, and I think that's a really great, um, you know, reminder and offering of what's possible. And I just want to bring us back to our final question, which is also um, a participant question as well, reimagined. And the question is, how can philanthropy support accessibility and inclusion for voters with disabilities, both from a disability specific and mainstreaming lens? Ooh, I have some thoughts. I know. There's another <laughs> How might uh, this vary for national and local private and public foundations? I think there are some things that are probably universal to all those types of foundations. And that's you have a lot of power when you are the ones who are giving out the cash. So require that they make everything accessible and put that in writing. If they're signing a contract with you and they're taking your money, their website and their materials and their social media and everything should meet federal accessibility standards, period. And they shouldn't be able to produce anything for you that doesn't. And let them know exactly what those laws and standards are, right? There's a lot of designers out there who would love to make you a website who could not tell you what WCAG 2.0 AA compliant is, but I know, and I can't even build a website. Uh, that's a problem, right? We can require those things up front when we're actually giving out these kinds of funds. And I think we can also require inclusive practices. If you're pulling together a coalition or a board of advisors or whatever it is as part of a grant funded project, how are you actually being inclusive of people with disabilities in that process and put it in writing and and I think funders can review those processes and say, we don't see representation here from the disability community. And I think that's possible for big and small foundations and whatever they're funding. I think that those are pretty universal things that we could be doing and that quite frankly, we should be doing because some of those things in terms of the accessibility are existing law. We should be making sure that people we're funding are doing it. Imani, any thoughts? Yeah, I agree with wholeheartedly with what Michelle said. I think that a lot of, and to be, and I want to um, broach this very delicately, but a lot of philanthropy, there's a, there's a charity model of disability and a lot of philanthropy likes to utilize the presence of people with disabilities in their organizations to make themselves appear woke or appear intersectional. Um, but even your organizations need to have disability leadership. Even your organizations need to make themselves accessible. Um, and it's not just about holding somebody else up to account, it's holding yourselves up to account too. Um, and a lot of disabled people will not want to be associated with a philanthropy, a charity model of disability or philanthropy because we believe that these are our rights. And we shouldn't need other organizations to verify or validate our rights. But 
here we are. So what I'll say is make sure that you, you yourselves are holding yourselves to the same standard you're holding everybody else to. Um, making sure that you don't tokenize disabled people or use our presence to do other things that are not really good for our community um, or other racial communities. Making sure that you are building capacity um, within your organization to, to, to make things accessible to us and make sure that we're included. Um, so I just wanted to give that caveat because I feel like a lot of disabled people would be, you know, are very much so, um, we're worn out by this, you know, this philanthropic model of having our, our rights met. That's true. And I think part of holding yourself accountable as a funder is to also fund us. If you look at the mix of organizations that you're funding and you see all types of voting rights and civil rights and human rights work and you don't see any disability organizations, we can't be relying on other communities that are getting funded to include us in the work that they're getting funded for. And that's also a little bit problematic, right? If you're funding non-disability organizations and they're pulling in disability leaders who aren't getting any of the cash, but are helping contribute to the work, why aren't you also funding disability organizations to do the work that we do? Some of us could really use that influx of funding to do some really, really critical work. So I think you also have to kind of be a little bit introspective and take a look at who have we traditionally funded and who have we traditionally not funded. Absolutely. And, you know, I just wanted to, um, for folks who are listening and taking notes and wanted um, a brief overview, some of the things that Imani and Michelle shared included <clears throat> uh, holding yourselves accountable creating an accountability outline. How are you going to follow through with what you say you wanna do and put that in writing. Um, they've also shared to um, do a more diverse and inclusive pool of uh, clients, but also of consultants. So not just picking one person to be the disability consultant, but picking a team of people that can represent a variety of different individuals and that also have relationships with disabled community members as well. We also hear about them funding disabled people and their projects and work. And so looking at where your funds are going and who you're prioritizing and asking yourself, why don't we have any disabled people? How can we change that? And that might mean not funding another project to fund a, dis a disability-led one. Um, and finally, releasing yourselves from the charity model of disability, which is deeply rooted in this idea of saviorism. Disabled people do not need to be saved. We do not need to be saved. We need to be given our civil rights. And what that looks like is also understanding the social model of disability as asking us to think about not just disability, but what is debilitating and making us experience inaccessible access um, or inaccessible experiences to voting. And finally, I would add um, embracing and being guided by a disability justice framework and principles. So thank you so much to Michelle and Imani. Thank you to our ASL interpreters. Thank you to our transcribers. We appreciate you. And at this time, I'd like to turn it over to Claire Bell, which means that our panelists and myself are going to turn our microphones off and also turn our cameras off. So Claire Bell. I had to stop snapping quickly um, to turn on my camera. Uh, good afternoon. Good morning and good evening to those that are joining us on the East or the West Coast and anyone that may be joining us in different parts of the world. My name is Clarabel Vidal, my pronouns are she, her, and I am the program associate on Ford's US Civic Engagement and Government Team. I am wearing a brown and black top with red lipstick and my hair is curly. And I am sitting in a white room with a painting behind me. Before we close out today, I wanted to take a few minutes to express my gratitude to everyone that has helped this event possible and to also leave my peers in philanthropy with three action steps to consider post this event. So to the brilliant and amazing speakers and moderator, Michelle Bishop, Imani Barbarin, and Dr. Bianca Loriano, Thank you for sharing your expertise. Thank you for nourishing us today and for helping us center the voices of people with disabilities in today's conversation. To the Advisory Council, which is comprised of predominantly BIPOC disability justice leaders, 
Thank you for guiding us on the design of what we hope will be a very informative and powerful 8830 series. And last but definitely not least, to my Ford colleagues on the planning committee, on the events and AV team, and those in our program teams that are support, supporting disability in their existing work, thank you. And finally, to our funder colleagues, I'll keep this brief. We all know that, local, that 2020 local and federal elections will be very important ones, and that they will be marked by numerous challenges, some new obstacles that have surfaced due to the pandemic, and some old barriers that are related to entrenched voter suppression tactics that have existed in our country for centuries. So for the funders on this call, especially those who are resourcing voting rights and other forms of civic engagement, our hope at Ford is that as you strategize and deliberate over your grant making portfolio this year and beyond, that you're walking away with a new found or even a deeper understanding of what's at stake when you leave disability out of your reimagining for a just and inclusive future. That you recall to memory the wisdom the civil rights warrior Andre Lord shared, that there is no such thing as a single issue struggle because we do not live single issue lives. So the first action item, put simply, is that you're applying an intersectional approach like we heard today to your existing grant making that includes people with disabilities. And that piece is very important. This means that as you're always advocating and prioritizing for those communities that are marginalized by policies and systems that we know do not seek to serve them, that you are recognizing people with disabilities as one of those communities. The second, as you also heard today, is to build relationships within the disability movement by staying connected. You can reach out to colleagues at Ford, to the speakers, to the organizations they mentioned today. And then there are so many great organizations that are doing a lot of work with little resources. So let's plug in. Another way to stay connected is to complete the event survey that we will be sending in the next few days and for, to share what you're still sitting with, what are the questions you're wrestling with, and to give us input so that we can improve the series for you. And last, because I promised I would be brief, to continue to expand your learning in the disability rights field. And the way that we, and to help you with that effort, we have put together a short list of resources, we, which we will also share, for, to equip you to continue this conversation within your institution. So again, thank you for learning with us, and I hope that you enjoy the rest of your day. Goodbye.